take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth, we're in chapter 2 together, and we've been looking at this story in the book of Ruth together. One of the greatest love stories ever written, but far more than the love between uh, two people, this book reflects the love of God. This book reflects the love of God towards his people, towards us as his children. And so far in this story, as we've gone, we've, we've had a lot of dark days. The first chapter is just kind of sad. <laughs> it's just a lot of sorrow, a lot of sadness, and, and the narrator kind of leaves us wondering, what's going to happen? What's going to take place? How, how is God going to resolve this conflict, this issue? And, and last week, uh, we saw uh, Neil preach uh, and showed us that you know, Naomi's just, she's bitter. She feels alone. She feels lost. She feels that God's kind of abandoned her, and she's discouraged. But despite the circumstances, uh, Ruth has not lost hope. I'm sure she's wrestling with some of the same emotions and the same, the same things that uh, Naomi is from the circumstances that they're in, but Ruth has not lost hope. And so uh, in the beginning of chapter 2, we see Ruth begins to head out towards the field. They are widows, and so nobody's providing for them, and so they have to provide for themselves. And so Ruth says, I'm going to go out in the field. I'm going to gather food so that we have something to eat so that we do not starve to death. And we're left wondering uh, in the beginning of chapter 2, what's going to happen? Are they going to be provided for? Are they going to be left alone? What will happen to them? How will they survive? And if you've read ahead, then, then you get the answer. But the narrator leaves us with that tension. And as we come to this section this morning, we begin to see the answers to those questions. And we're introduced to a character that we, we saw last week in the beginning of chapter 2, but we didn't meet him. We were just kind of somewhat introduced to him. And that is the character of Boaz. And Boaz is a remarkable uh, uh, character in Scripture. He's a remarkable person because in Boaz, we get to see a a visible expression of the grace of God. We get to see a visible picture as we look at Boaz and how he treats people and how he responds to circumstances. We get to see an actual living, uh, breathing picture of the grace of God. And we see that God has not forgotten his children That God has a plan. He has a plan all along. A plan to love them. A plan to show them His grace. And and through Boaz this morning, we see that he begins to to do that. So let's take a look together at Ruth chapter 2. I'm going to go ahead and begin in verse 1 because it sets the context for us. Uh, But beginning in verse 1. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. Verse 4, where we begin today. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. And have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then Ruth fell on her face. Bowing to the ground, she said to him, 
Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done. And a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me. You have spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and, she, and he passed to her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. And when she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean. And do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. And then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Let's pray. Father, what a, what a powerful picture of how we are to use power and influence and authority, how we are to be gracious, how we are to be humble, how we are to be caring, how we are to be loving. Father, we pray that as we look at this story, Lord, that, that we would see, even beyond Boaz, Lord, ultimately, that we would see that Christ is our example. And Father, this morning, through your word, you would conform us more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. So teach us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So in verses 1 through 4 that we looked at last week, we get the setting of what's going on. And Ruth is Ruth and Naomi are, are by themselves. They're alone. They're hungry. And so Ruth goes out to find food. And we're introduced to this character, Boaz, in verse 1. We see that he is of the clan of Elimelech. The, the narrator gives us a little bit of insight and then also tells us that, that he is a worthy man. And so we're introduced a little bit to him, but this morning we see him come into much more clarity. And now in verse 4, Boaz arrives. Ruth is, has uh, come to Boaz's field by God's providence, and now Boaz arrives. Verse 4, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. And the Hebrew that begins this, and behold, is very much like the, the Hebrew that, that speaks to, and, and, it, and suddenly it came about. Uh, and, and it just so happened. You see, the narrator is using this language to show us that the, it is by no mistake that Boaz shows up at the field at the exact same time as Ruth is at the field. This is God's providential hand. This is God at work in the midst of, of this story. And we are reminded as we as we look at this, the narrator wants us to see, he's asking the question, don't you see God's hand at work that God is behind this story? And the Lord in our story asks the same question, as you're going through challenges, even as you go through difficulties, do not forget that God is at work. That God's hand is present. Do you realize that God has a plan for you as well? Even when it seems like things are so dark and so hard and so desperate, God has not forgotten you. God is at work. And here we see that, that, that story begins to unfold, that God has not left them. He has not forgotten them. Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he begins by saying, the Lord be with you, and they answered, the Lord bless you. And so the first thing we see as Boaz arrives is that Boaz is a man of godly character. Now, Boaz must have been an amazing boss to work for. 
as we see who he is here, as we see his character, as we see the way he runs his field, as we see the way he greets his workers, uh, they love him, he loves them, and there is an attitude of grace in this situation. And, and here we see a picture of, of how those that have power and influence and authority are to use that responsibility. You see, we turn on the news and we see people of power and authority and influence, and we see many that are doing harm. We're in a time in, uh, in our culture right now where, uh, where the abuse of, of women in the workplace has no longer been tolerated, and so now story after story, I mean, just this week, two prominent uh, politicians again uh, brought before the ethics committee for situations that are taking place where women have been harmed because people in power and authority have used their power and authority for their selfish gain and for the harm of others. But here, not Boaz. We see the opposite of that. We see a man, yes, who has power and authority, yes, who has influence, but he uses that influence not to harm, but to help. Not to, not to injure, but to bless. And here we see a picture of, of how we are to use that as well. If the Lord has given you any kind of influence, if the Lord has given you any kind of authority, He has not given you that for yourself. He's not given you that so that you can serve yourself. He's given you that so you can serve others. That's true in the home. That's true in the workplace. If you are a business owner, what a privilege you have to be able to bless the lives of others. What a privilege you have to be able to to reflect the grace of God in your workplace to your employees. Do they see Jesus in how you treat them? Or are you just another person interested in profit? Are you just another person interested in using them for your gain? See, Christians should be different. They should be different in the workplace. They should be different in the home. They should be different in every avenue and every environment that they enter. The grace of God should go with us wherever we go. And that's what we see with Boaz. We see the grace of God. The response of his workers reflect the admiration that they had, the respect that they had for him. They answer him back, the Lord bless you as well. Verse 5, then Boaz said to his young man who is in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? And the servant who is in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And so Boaz is on his field. He knows all of his workers by name. And as he looks at over his fields and as he looks at the workers, he notices a, a woman. She's off by herself. She is uh, by her, she's, she's by herself, apart from the other workers, and, and Boaz has compassion and care for this woman. So he inquires with the foreman, who is this? And as the foreman explains who she is, we know that Ruth, by her testimony, is now known in Bethlehem. Ruth, by her character, is now known in Bethlehem. And so Boaz has heard about her, and and he responds in verse seven, or sorry, in verse seven, the, the foreman goes on. He says, She has asked, or she said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. And so here we see the character of Ruth as well. We see this persistence. We see this hard working. We see her trying to care for her mother in law and to glean means to come after um, those that were, were reaping the field, those that were uh, gathering the harvest, and they would leave some behind so that the poor would be able to have something. Now, this was built into God's law. It was actually part of God's law. And God had a law that as they, as they uh, gathered in their field, that they were to not gather all of it, but they were to leave some behind for those that were poor. We see all over the place in the scripture God's heart for the poor and the disenfranchised. We see it in the person of Christ as well, and we see it in the New Testament, and hopefully we see it in our lives as well.
Boaz has a heart for the poor, and so he, he uh, uh, calls her, uh, realizes who she is, and so verse 8, he, calls, he, he brings her over. And in verse 8, he speaks to her. Then Boaz says to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Now just stop for a moment and imagine this scene. Ruth is out gleaning in the fields. She is at the mercy of those that go before her. She has no protection. She she is a widow. She is a foreigner. She's a Moabite. She's an enemy, actually. Uh, The Moabites were an enemy of Israel. So she's in a foreign land as a foreigner, gleaning on this field, completely at the mercy of those that she encounters. And the master of the field walks up to her or has her summoned to him. Somebody goes and gets her, brings her to Boaz. You can imagine the kind of fear, anxiety, intimidation that she would feel, cowering. What will this man do? (laughs) Will he throw me out? Will he... Will he beat me? Will he, you know, worse? What will he do to me? And look at what Boaz says. Imagine what these words sounded like to Ruth. Listen, my daughter. Boaz starts out calling her his daughter. This tender affection, this tender care. This man who has power and authority, using it to care for those who have none. What a great picture of what God does with us. As we come to Him, we have nothing to give, nothing to offer, nothing to bring to Him. And God could crush us and destroy us and stomp us. We have sinned against Him. We have rebelled against Him. And yet, what does God do as we come to Him in grace and in faith? God receives us as children. God adopts us. He loves us. He forgives us. This is the character of our God reflected in this godly man Boaz. He's not concerned with who she is or what she came from. He shows her love and dignity and respect. And in doing so, he gives four instructions here, which all reveal his character, who Boaz is as a man. And we see, first of all, that Boaz provides Boaz provides, he says, do not go glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young woman. Uh, Boaz says, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to care for you. You don't need to go to another field. Don't leave this field because I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to care for you. In fact, follow my, uh, my, the women that work for me. Be close to them. He begins to socially accept her into their group. She's no longer a foreigner in their eyes. Verse 9, let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. He says, follow them, learn from them. You no longer have to worry. Imagine the anxiety that begins to leave Ruth as this man begins to care for her, as he begins to provide for her. He uses his power, his wealth, his influence, not for his own gain, but to care and to provide for others. Secondly, we see Boaz protects. He says, Has, have I not charged the young men not to touch you? Now, this was a real danger, a real fear for a young woman, a widow, who had no protection, no husband to protect her. And Boaz says, you don't need to worry. You are safe 
in my field. It's like the first uh, sexual harassment policy <laughs> that Boaz puts in place. And he says, you do not need to worry. You are safe here. Boaz uses his power to protect. What a great picture of what we as Christians and what we as the church are to be, that we are to protect. This should be a safe place for people. It should be a place where people can come and find safety and, and express their, their, their neediness, express their, their hurt, express their sin, and find grace. It should be a safe place. And then again, we see the provision of Boaz, even more so. He says, when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Now, this is an amazing reversal. Because in culturally, at this time, the young women and the slaves would draw water for the men. But not on Boaz's field. On Boaz's field, the men draw water for the women and for the servants. You see the reversal of power and authority? You see how this, this, the, 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 the power and the authority and the influence that he has, how he's using that, not for his gain, but to serve others. This is a radical picture of grace. This is a visible picture of grace. It's a visible picture of how we as Christians should be radically different in how we treat People, we are in such a crazy time and such a crazy culture right now where people are just angry and vile and mean, where there is just bitterness between individuals. And we as believers, we should be grace. Those that that are walking in, in sin, they are not our enemies. There's a real enemy. That real enemy is spiritual. He is a spiritual force. And by God's grace, Christ has already won the victory. And so we can walk in victory. But friends, you need to remember that those that are trapped by the enemy, those that are held captive by the enemy, those that have the thought and the mind of the enemy, they are not the enemy. They are victims of the enemy. And we, by God's grace, have opportunity to walk in the space of people's lives and to be grace to them, to show them the grace of Jesus Christ, to love them, to welcome them into our homes, to be hospitable, to destroy the stereotypes that they are going to have immediately as they encounter us. May they be overwhelmed by the grace of Christians as Ruth was overwhelmed by the grace of Boaz. This is a picture for us. It's a radical picture of how we are to use any kind of power or influence that we've been given to serve others. It's a radical picture for me as a man of how I'm called to lead my home. This is a humbling reminder that leading the home is not about demanding our way. It's not about trying to force people to serve us, but rather leading our homes is about being the biggest servant. It's about leading through grace and providing an environment of grace and love. It's about providing. It's about protecting. It's about care. This is what biblical manhood is. This is what true biblical leadership and headship is about. This is what uh, what true biblical um, uh, a vision for manhood really should look like. For far too long, it's, it's looked like this vision of male chauvinism of the world. That's not what we are called to biblically. Yes, we are called as men to lead our homes. Yes, we are called to lead in the church. But we are called to lead by being the greatest servant. By being the example as Christ has called us. This is biblical manhood.
And we see it in Boaz. And look at how Ruth responds to this grace. This is the response that men, if you, if you say, well, my wife doesn't submit to me. Well, ask yourself, are you a servant? Are you serving her? Are you leading her? Are you loving her? Have you provided an environment of grace and protection and love? Because look at Ruth's response. She, she honors him. Verse 10, And she fell on her face, bowing to the ground. And she said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Ruth was overwhelmed by Boaz's grace. Not by his power, not by his authority, not by who he was, but by his character of grace. May it be the same with us. And Boaz tells her why in verse 11. Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. How you left your father and mother in your native land and you came to a people that you did not know before. Boaz says, I know I, I don't know you, but I know you. I know your testimony. I know your story. You see, Ruth, your story has gone before you. You didn't even know people were watching you. You didn't even know people were looking at you. But your story, your testimony has earned you favor. Friends, you realize that your life tells a story to the world. There are people watching you that you don't even know. And what do they say about you? What is your character in the community? What does your life speak to amongst your neighbors and your friends and your coworkers? What do people say about you? Do they reflect on you as being a person of character? Do they reflect on you as being a person that loves Christ? A person that is known for their witness? Or is your life centered on something completely different? See, people are watching our lives. What are they going to see as they look at our story? For Ruth, her story had gone before her. In verse 12, Boaz says, The Lord repay you for what you've done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So Boaz prays this beautiful prayer over Ruth. And he says, I pray the Lord blesses you. I pray the Lord uh, repays you. I can't even repay you. Even what I'm doing right now is no repayment for what you have done for your mother-in-law. So I pray that God himself repays you because he is the only one who can repay you. Boaz reminds us that God blesses faithfulness. You see, in the beginning of the story, we're concerned, we're confused. Like, why, is, why are all these bad things happening? And yet, as we continue on in the story, we see that God rewards faithfulness. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but God rewards faithfulness. Friends, if, if only in eternity, which is the greatest thing, God rewards faithfulness, your faithfulness will be rewarded. And here Boaz is, a, is, is, is actually the answer to his own prayer. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? That Boaz is praying, but as he's praying, he's actually answering the prayer at the same time. He says in the prayer that, that God would be uh, whose wings you have come to take refuge. He gives this picture of God protecting Ruth, like a, like a mother bird that would put their wings over their young and protect them from any harm. And he says, I pray that God would protect you. And then it's, it's, it's ironic in a sense that Boaz is actually the one that is protecting Ruth. Boaz is answering his own prayer. See, God answers prayer and meets needs most often through people. Through faithful people who obey him, who love him, who serve him. He uses them to answer and to meet needs. God doesn't just miraculously, boom, you know, meet a need. Sometimes he does that, but most of the time he meets needs through the regular faithfulness of people. 
So sometimes when you're praying that prayer, and you're praying for somebody, and you're saying, Lord, please provide for that person. <laughs> Maybe you're the person that's supposed to be doing the providing. God, please care for that person. Maybe you and I are the person that is supposed to be caring for that person. God answers prayers, and he does so through using his children, you and I, to serve others. So Boaz here is a picture of God's grace in the lives of others. How about you and me? Is our life a picture to others? Is how we respond to needs, how we care for others, how we put others above ourselves? Is that a picture for others of, of God's grace or do they just see in us what they see in the entire everybody else in the world that we just use what we can for our own glory? If we are in Christ, our lives should be different. Verse 13, then she said, I have found favor. That word again, chesed, that we've looked at over and over. I have found grace. I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me. You have spoken kindly to your servant, though I'm not one of your servants. You see, Boaz is visibly grace in Ruth's life. Listen to the words, you have comforted me. You have spoken kindly to me. She says, you have have accepted me. I was a foreigner, but you have accepted me. This is a picture of grace. A picture of God's grace. This is a picture of what we are to be in the lives of one another. And what we are to be in the lives of those in this world. And then in verse 14, there's kind of a break. And so you can imagine in this narrative, they go back out in the field. They continue to work. And then lunchtime comes. In verse 14, we enter into a new scene. And in verse 14, it says, At mealtime, Boaz came to her. Or, sorry, Boaz said to her, come here, eat some bread, and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed her her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. And so it's lunchtime. It's lunch break. And if you were ever the kid that went and sat by yourself at lunch, just wondering who was going to sit by you or were you going to sit there all by yourself that whole time? Or if you're ever the person that goes to the, the lunch workroom and sits by yourself while everybody else is laughing and joking, you can imagine the type of isolation. Yes, Boaz had blessed her before, but now Ruth is sitting by herself. She's by herself because she still sees herself as a foreigner. She still sees herself as not part of this group. And what does Boaz do? Boaz goes and he... He accepts her. He walks over and he tells her, come and, and come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel. This is social acceptance, right? Come and, and she, she, she probably didn't have any food. She's probably just sitting there with a glass of water that he had given her. And he says, no, 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 come here. Here's some bread for you to eat. And, and dip it in this sour wine sauce to make it taste better. And, 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 and then, oh, by the way, here's... Verse, he continues on. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed her her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. So here we see the radical generosity of Boaz. Now notice, the, notice what the narrator is trying to show us. Notice that Ruth came completely empty. She came with nothing. And now here she is and she has been received. And she has been satisfied. Boaz is going to make sure that she does not leave the way that she came. By his life, by his grace, by using his power and influence and authority, he is going to make sure that she is blessed. Because he is a picture of grace. And just in case we didn't fully understand how generous Boaz was, by giving her grain so that she's satisfied and even has some left over, It goes on in verse 15, when she rose to glean, 
Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So Boaz, again, protects her, provides for her, and he tells his workers, he says, Okay, listen, this Ruth, she's special. She's not like the other ones that are are gleaning on our field. You let her in the inner circle. You let her in where all the workers are, where they're, you know, where they're getting grain and they're putting it in bundles. Now you can imagine that if you owned a big field and this was your livelihood, that you made sure that all the all the riffraff stayed out of the area where everybody was working. You made sure that where the wheat or the barley was being piled up, that you know. None of the poor got around that because if they would, they just would grab it and run or something, right? And so, so they were to stay out on the outer skirts where they understood their place in a mindset, right? That's kind of the mindset of power and authority. And yet Boaz doesn't have that mindset. Boaz says, I want you to invite her in. I want her to be able to be amongst the workers. Oh, and just in case that's not enough, I want you as you're going along to pull out huge handfuls of barley and leave them on the floor for her so that she doesn't even have to work very hard. She can just pick it up and put it in her bag. Can you just imagine Ruth's day? Like she left in the morning telling Naomi, I I hope that I can go find some food so that we can eat tonight so that we don't die. And she goes to this field having no idea what she's going to receive, but she receives God's grace. And she receives it through the person of Boaz, who just pours out grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And by the end of the day, she's just overwhelmed by God's grace. Here we see a a picture of radical generosity. What a great picture of God's grace. What a great picture of the radical generosity that God calls us to have. I mean, you already know this, but I'll just remind you, the stuff that God has given you is not for your own personal comfort. The money that God allows you to make is not so that you can build bigger and bigger homes and buy faster and more expensive cars and more and more toys. The stuff that God has given us is so that we can be a blessing to others. And that doesn't mean that you're called to live in poverty. That doesn't mean that that you can't have a nice house that you use for hospitality and care for people. What it means is that money should not be your God. And if money is not your God, then you will you will love God and use your money instead of instead of loving money and using people. Money will be different in your life. How you use your resources says much about what you love. And are you characterized by radical grace and generosity? As followers of Christ, we have a radically generous God. And we are called to be radically generous in return. One way that people will know of our worship is how we use our resources And here we see a picture of Boaz being radically generous for the blessing of others. Verse 17, we conclude, So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Now, if maybe your Bibles and the footnotes there, they tell you an ephah is about 29 or 30 pounds. Now, just... Think about that for a moment. Like, she goes to glean a few stalks of barley so that they can eat at night, and instead she walks away with 30 pounds of provision. Now, to put that in a little more perspective, the average wage of a male worker was one to two pounds of what they were reaping. And so she walks away with half a month's wages of provision, of care, because of the radical generosity. 
of Boaz and of God. Do you see the picture there? Do you see what the narrator's doing? As he shows us in the beginning of chapter 1, Ruth leaves empty, but she does not return that way. Yes, there will be times where there is struggle. Yes, there will be times where there is difficulty. But God has not forgotten you. God's grace still abounds. What a beautiful picture of God's amazing and abundant grace to us. It's a beautiful picture of what Christ is in our lives. We come to Christ absolutely empty. We have nothing to give Him. We have nothing to bring Him. We are destitute. And yet God, by His grace and His mercy, through Christ Jesus, gives us riches beyond imagination. Not not material riches, but spiritual riches. He forgives us. He rescues us. He adopts us. He justifies us. He sanctifies us. And one day, ultimately, He will glorify us. This is a beautiful picture of us coming in empty and leaving with more than we could ever imagine. Friends, this is the gospel. This is what Christ has done for us. That He has rescued us and redeemed us when we were foreigners. You see, if Boaz is a picture of God's grace, then Jesus Christ is the greater picture of God's grace. Boaz was generous with his grain, but Jesus was generous in giving his very life. Boaz invited the foreigner in, but Jesus actually died for the sinner. Boaz protected the vulnerable from harm, but Jesus protected us from the wrath of God for the sin that we deserved. Boaz showed kindness and compassion through his actions, but Jesus left all that he had to rescue lost sinners who could never rescue themselves. You see, if Boaz is a picture of God's grace, then Jesus Christ is an even greater picture. And if you're here this morning, if you've never recognized and realized that God loves you, you need to see in Boaz a picture of of what God's love is for you. That if you enter here empty today, if you enter here lost, if you enter here a sinner, that God offers forgiveness. He offers grace. He offers redemption. And as we are conformed into the image of Christ, we too should be a picture of grace in the lives of others. Boaz had no idea that his name was being written down in God's word. He was just living his life to honor God. He had no idea the influence that this would have for generation upon generation upon generation, that God would use him to rescue others. He was just being a faithful man. And that's what God's called us to be, instruments of grace in the lives of others. That as we faithfully live out our lives, loving the Lord Jesus Christ and loving others as we've been called to, as we are a faithful man or a faithful woman of God, God will use our story, God will use our grace to meet needs in others and to point people to the love of Jesus Christ. My prayer is that as people enter into this family here at Grace Bible, that they would see that grace that they would feel that grace, that they would receive that grace, and, lo- and that they would be transformed by it as they realize that, that that grace does not come from us. We are not good people. We are sinners that have been rescued and redeemed by a great and loving God. That they too might come to know that Lord and that Savior, that He might become their Savior as well. Friends, notice in this story the attributes of a godly man or woman. Kindness, provision, protection, care, generosity, comfort, acceptance, grace. Is that what our lives look like? Is that how the world sees us? 
Is that the reflection that we are? Because that's the reflection of Christ. That's what Christ looks like. That's what we should look like as well. My prayer is that our lives would be a reflection of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to a world that so desperately needs to see that. That's what we're called to as Christians. That's what we're called to as his church. Let's ask God that he would grant us that favor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we pray for our nation, for our state, for our city. But Lord, ultimately, we pray for ourselves. God, that we would be the living change that we desire. Lord, we can't impact the course of the world, but Father, we can choose to live in obedience to your word, and we can be a model of grace. And and Father, we can be a light in this city and in Central Oregon. And so, Father, we pray that by your grace that you would strengthen us for that task. We pray, Lord, that we would learn from the example of Boaz and more significantly, we would learn from the example of Jesus. God, that we would be a witness, that we would be a testimony to your grace, that when people hear our story, when they see our lives, when they see how we do life differently, Lord, that, God, they would see your grace in us. So, Lord, we pray that where we have yet to be conformed to the image of your Son, Jesus, you would continue the work of conforming us. God, that you, by your your Spirit, by your power, Lord, by your grace, you would turn us and make us more into the image of of your son. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.